Welcome to the Winter Games. We're going to look at what types of energy transformation goes on during a ski jump. Unlike in typical energy conservation law situations, we're going to allow for dissipative forces, like friction between the skis and the snow, or air resistance, to do work on the jumper, so that some of the initial energy in the system is dissipated as heat. This allows us to analyze the situation with a bit more realism than we would if we simply neglected those non-conservative forces. In this simulation, the system starts with a lot of gravitational potential energy. The force of gravity between the jumper and the Earth depends on the mass of the jumper and the strength of the gravitational field. On Earth, this is about 10 newtons per kilogram, sometimes said as 9.8 newtons per kilogram. The work needed to lift the jumper from ground level up to the top of the ski jump is then the force times the height of the jumper. This means the gravitational potential energy is calculated by multiplying the mass of the jumper times g times the initial starting height. We can set the initial jump height with the slider at right. Let's set it to 140 meters. That's a long way down, more than a football field. And we can set the mass of the jumper using the slider at top left. Let's set it to medium. Right now, the jumper's form is poor. What this means is that she isn't doing a great job of controlling the orientation of her body during the jump to minimize dissipative drag forces such as air resistance. Let's set her form to excellent. We see that the total energy, shown in the right of the graph at top, is made up entirely of potential energy. This is the initial potential energy in the system and the source of energy for the entire jump. Notice that the units of this energy are in kilojoules, or thousands of joules, and that the initial energy of the jumper is measured in tens of thousands of joules. That's a lot of energy, part of what makes this sport so dangerous. As the simulation progresses, we see an exchange start to happen. In an ideal situation, all of the gravitational potential energy would convert to kinetic. This is what would happen if the slope were totally frictionless and there were no air resistance. However, since there are dissipative drag forces, we see that some of the initial energy converts to both kinetic energy and heat. The speed of the jumper is determined solely by the kinetic energy and the mass of the jumper. More speed will allow for a longer jump. At the end of the jump, all of the initial potential energy is gone, and we can see where it went, some to kinetic energy and some dissipated as heat energy. What is not shown here is that as the skier slides to a rest, all of the kinetic energy will eventually be dissipated as heat. Instead, we stop right at the moment the skier touches the ground. One point worth discussing. Both gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy are directly proportional to the skier's mass. So as long as there are no dissipative forces, and all of the gravitational potential energy converts totally into kinetic energy, then the speed of the jumper won't depend at all on her mass. This is why we say, in the absence of air resistance, all objects speed up at the same rate when falling. However, once you introduce a drag force that is independent of mass, like air resistance, the situation is more complicated, and mass starts to affect the underlying trajectory. The real-life situation is often more complicated than our initial idealistic models. This doesn't mean we dismiss those models, but we approach them with more care. Thank you for watching.